months. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I hope that what I have to say is uh, interest and value to you. My colleagues here thought that it might be. So um, let's get started. Uh, as Sean said, uh, I have background uh, in academic study of languages uh, throughout most of my own education. Uh, that's what I studied in school. Uh, so by the time I got my PhD, I had uh, learned to some degree uh, at least a dozen languages. Uh, but since then, I have continued studying and learning on my own and really sort of perfected, I would hope, or striven to uh, improve self-study habits. I've found that if you're really motivated in learning languages, um, you can obviously get a great start from your teacher in your classroom, but you have to take control of the learning process yourself and, and keep it driving forward. So if you want to continue making progress after your class is done and all classes are eventually going to be over, you need to know about some techniques and strategies and things that you can use and do on your own. So um, I really know lots of these different techniques and strategies, dozens of them, but I have two main techniques that I consider sort of my primary staples. And these are things that I have spoken about uh, at length at all sorts of conferences and, and written papers and, and done educational videos about. I could speak about any one of them in great detail for um, an hour, but we don't have that much time. So I just wanna give an introduction and description of them, talk about ways that you can use them uh, and talk about ways that you can monitor them and then offer ways to get more information about them. So without further ado, uh, the first technique that I wanna talk about is I call shadowing. And I call it shadowing because what you do, uh, this is a spoken technique and you shadow the voice of a speaker. You go along right behind it. Uh, and so it's, you can sort of visualize, here's something coming ahead and then you are there, you try to stay as close to it as possible. So when something moves, your shadow moves with it. So uh, this is a technique, as I said, it's a spoken technique. So it can help people improve their production, their overall speaking, their pronunciation, uh, because you're going along with the voice of the speaker above anything, the natural rhythm uh, of, of a speaker. And many people, when they're in classes, they sort of get out of balance. Their passive skills, so their listening skills, uh, in, are greater than their active skills, their speaking skills. This technique can help you balance that out. So uh, as I already sort of adumbrated, what you basically do is you need to listen to audio. And at the same moment that you hear something, you speak it. Obviously, there's got to be a, a microsecond, a nanosecond uh, of, for you to take in the sound before you can produce it, but you don't wait for a pause. You don't wait to hear a whole phrase. You need to develop the reflex, the ability to start producing the sound the second that you hear it, the very instant that it comes into your ears, you're going to start making it and speaking it out yourself. This is quite difficult if you've never done it before. It's quite difficult uh, when you get started. Uh, you feel tongue-tied. You feel like you're tripping all over the face, the place. Even if you use stuff that is spoken at a slow pace or you deliberately slow it down, it feels like the speakers are going too fast for you and you're tripping over yourself. But like anything, uh, if you practice this with practice, this becomes easier and easier and you get better and better at it. It's a skill that you learned like any other skill. <clears throat> so because it can be difficult at first, when a student first starts doing this, you can not only listen to audio and speak the sound as you hear it, you can also take a text and you can basically read along with it. Um, but ultimately, this technique works much better when you're not looking at a text than when you are. So if you need to, when you're starting out, uh, if it's too fast as a way for you to keep up with the sound that you're hearing, you can look at a text, but that's not something you want to stay with. That's a crutch and you want to throw it away when, as soon as you're able to do without it. Um, this is also something because it's difficult initially. One thing that you can do, you're working with audio recorded material, you can do the same material over and over again easier each time you do it, you know what's going to be said exactly. Uh, so it's possible to work with the same material over and over. 
But again, ultimately, what you want to be doing is developing your receptive ability to sounds. Uh, so ideally, you want to use fresh material each time, longer and longer material, new material, uh, and say it aloud each time. Um, when you're doing this, it's very important, the quality of your earphones, your earbuds. You don't want to do this uh, just with uh, something playing into your room. Headphones that fit over your ears also aren't very good. Noise canceling, high, really high quality earphones for listening to music are not good because they will, so what you want to do is you want to have a quality of earphone, mid, mid quality earphone, so that you can hear the sound and you can make the sound immediately. You don't want the sound to be muffled. You don't want the sound to be canceled out. You want to hear the sound and you want to say the sound at the same time you say it. And what's going to happen ultimately, particularly if in this earlier stage when you're repeating material over and over again, um, because you are taking in sound and repeating it instantaneously, if your pronunciation is off, if your rhythm is off, because you're hearing the input that's coming in is unchangeable and it's correct, the only thing that you can change is your output, the way the sound that you're making and the way that you're making it. And if you make a different sound when you're hearing a sound come in, there is sort of a discordance, there's a disharmony. Whereas if you make the same sound that you're hearing, it's harmonic, it sounds better, it feels better, it, the, 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 the vibration in your head is better, uh, and so you will self-correct. Um, <clears throat> this is also a technique, shadowing. You can do it uh, when you're sitting down at a desk, when you're looking at a book or something, uh, but you also find when you practice this, that this is something that's better done in motion, at very least combining, getting a little bit of exercise, walking around. Uh, it helps you stay focused on the material a bit better. Um, it helps you uh, breathe a little bit better, uh, have better posture, and just all in all works better. Not necessarily for everybody, but uh, recommendation is that you do this not while you're seated, but while you're standing, while you're striding. Uh, if that doesn't work, then by all means have a seat. But this is something that's uh, best done in my practice uh, when you are moving about. So that's one technique. This is a technique for the uh, speaking and listening skills, balancing them out. Another technique that I have uh, is I call this scriptorium. Scriptorium is uh, in a medieval monastery where monks used to copy texts. And this is a way of copying texts that helps you do a number of things. This really is a way of reducing errors with writing, uh, reducing errors in spelling, and overall improving your grammar. Um, this is something, again, if you want to have balance in a classroom, you tend uh, to learn your reading skills are going to be better than your writing skills. Um, this will help you balance these out. So <clears throat> just as uh, shadowing is in essence basically listening and repeating simultaneously, so scriptorium is basically self-dictation, dictating a text to yourself and copying it down in a number of different stages. So what a student will do is you read a portion of a text aloud, then you look away, and I should have put here, um, you can do this typing, but this is done much better, uh, written by hand. Uh, and so you look at a text, you look away, and you write down what you just said aloud, what you just read and said aloud. And then you look back, and if you made any mistakes, you correct it immediately, and then you go on. So when you do this, just as with shadowing, you can start out and you can do the same text over. You can do small portions. When you do this, um, it is difficult at first, but it becomes easy with practice. When you do this, you can start out reading just one word at a time or two or three a set of words, um, then whole portions of a phrase or a clause, ultimately whole sentences. And if you get really good at this, you can read even more. You can get longer portions of text and you can say them uh, and you can repeat them and write them down and correct them. And you are forcing yourself when you do this to notice details, to write things down and to self-correct. So <clears throat> um, what kind of materials should you use if you wanna do shadowing and scriptorium? Um, you can do either of these. Maybe you're, you only want to do one of these. Maybe you're, you have no interest in one of them, one of the set of skills, or one set is just fine. 
Um, it's possible to do either of them alone, and it's possible to use different materials for doing both of these. But if you want to get maximum benefit uh, while using these skills, um, you should do both of these skills together, shadowing and scriptorium. And ideally, you would want to use the same material for both of them. Um, the exact same text or the same thing you'd be listening to is the same thing that you would be looking at, reading, and copying. So I understand that some students, particularly in your things, you might be wanting to listen to a certain particular type of document, a certain particular type of text, a radio broadcast or something. You can do this with any kind of text. But if students who come through an advanced program are pretty good in many things, but they, they lack colloquialisms, you know, they can't pick up when somebody's being sarcastic or has some, uh, some other kind of tone in their voice. If you sort of get the main idea, but you miss the nuances, in that case, the best kind of text to work with are, are fiction, novels, texts, things like this. And it's quite easy for many languages to get both uh, the printed text and an audiobook. So working with these kind of texts will help you with uh, these aspects of a language. Um, and in order to get the best use out of these kind of texts, ideally, and this is a bit more complicated, so as a student is going to have a hard time doing this themselves, but uh, you as instructors or as, uh, as um, command language program managers, you can uh, organize this for them. Uh, what you want to do is combine this ideally with um, Paul Nation's notion of extensive reading. An extensive reading. Uh, in case you're not familiar with that term, says that you really should have about 98% vocabulary coverage in order to gain further knowledge uh, by just reading extensively. So you don't want to have massive recourse to a dictionary. You don't want to have massive recourse to not understanding. You want to pick up words uh, from context. You want to understand structure and new forms from context. So ideally, uh, you want to know out of a given text, when you read 50 words, you say, well, there's, there's one key word in there that I don't know. If I, if I know, uh, if, there's, if, there's 20, if one out of 25, then the text is too hard. I can read it, I can get the gist of it, I can stay on top of it you know, for a while, but if I'm gonna be reading a whole novel and I only have that level of coverage, that's not quite enough. So uh, ideally, you'd wanna choose a text that's, that's at the right level where students, as they're doing this, they can go along with this, um, they are, uh, practicing that extensive reading. <clears throat> how much of this should you do? How much of this should you do? How, how often or uh, in, in what quantities? So <clears throat> both of these techniques, shadowing and scriptorium, they really do work best when they become a regular systematic daily practice. Um, Brushing your teeth works best when you do it every day, not when you skip a couple of days. And this is that kind of thing. If you want your language skills to really become automatic, um, that's something that you should ideally, hopefully, um, not see as a burden, really have as a personal goal, and not mind doing on a regular systematic basis. If you have to, okay, if you resist that, I try to do this uh, with my sons. My sons refuse to work on weekends. They say it's the weekend. If you know, somebody says, I need to honor the Sabbath or for some other reason, I can't do it on a given day. Um, I think it's possible to get good benefit out of these things. Uh, if you say, okay, I'm gonna schedule days off, Tuesdays and Thursdays or weekends or something, uh, but you should just know that it's, it's not as effective as if you were to do it each and every single day. And if you want to, really get the benefit of developing it as a systematic habit, it will take a lot longer to establish if you don't do it every day, but you take days off. But it, it can be done on a sort of periodic basis like this, but it's not something. Uh, I think that these techniques are very uh, useful if you just do them once in a while, once in a blue moon. These are things that you need to do on a regular systematic basis. Uh, both of these techniques, shadowing and scriptorium, are best done when you do them in short time periods, if you do them several times a day, rather than at one long time interval together, particularly when you're just beginning. As I said, both of these can be quite fatiguing, particularly shadowing. Both of them can be quite demanding and almost frustrating if you are uh, trying to push yourself too hard, too fast, trying to sit there and do it for an hour at a time. 
Um, when you are really used to them, if you love them, you can work up to that. You can do them for an hour at a time. But initially, no, you don't want to do them for long periods. I would say short periods several times a day rather than at one long interval. Uh, as one suggestion, a good way to do it would be 10 minutes of shadowing followed by 10 minutes of scriptorium of the same text. So a 20 minute bout, a 20 minute study session uh, would be good. So you would take the audio, you'd listen to the audio, you'd speak along with the audio, you'd follow along with that. And then ideally you would have that text that maybe initially you needed to look at too as you were learning to do the shadowing, but you still have the text and you have that same text because now you just heard it and now you can read it aloud with more confidence and you won't get through the entire text in 10 minutes of writing as you would in 10 minutes of saying, but you can work with the same material. So I would say as an ideal, yeah, 10 minutes of one followed by 10 minutes of the other using the same text, 20 minutes at a time. And then if you really wanna get maximum benefit out of this, I would say in a given day, you'd wanna do a total of one hour, do it for an hour a day by doing this three times. Do 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, 20 minutes in the evening, okay? Uh, and that would be 60 minutes. This is good initially, okay? Um, if you can only do 20 minutes, that's fine, okay? If you, you know, you won't make as much progress, it won't be as good. Uh, but uh, if that's too much to strive for, um, so be it. But I would say uh, that to get maximum benefit, like I say, about an hour a day initially would be a good way to start using that, these techniques and really see if they are for you, if they work for you, if they're good for your, your benefit. Um, after that, if they work, if you like them, if the, the habit is good for you, okay, then you can do them for longer. Then you can sit and do scriptorium for an hour at a time. You can do shadowing, for an, go for an hour long walk and do it for an hour at a time. Okay, but uh, initially, as I said, I think shorter periods are better. So if these are things that we're going to be prescribing for students, how can we monitor them? How can we document the use of these techniques? How can we see that they're doing with them? Uh, I have several suggestions. Um, this being a training center, a school, the easiest way is through a test. Give them an exam give them an exam based on these very texts. So they're going to, they're doing self-dictation with scriptorium on a certain set of subset of texts at a certain point, they know, well, I'm gonna be given dictation and I need to be able to write down this text uh, and I need to be able to write it down well and perfectly. Um, at a certain point, I'm gonna be given this text to shadow and somebody's gonna record it and then they're gonna compare my voice to the original voice of the narrator and I'll be graded on how well I can do it. And if I practice it regularly, I'll do it very well. If I don't, I won't. Okay, so the knowledge that a test is looming potentially for any given text uh, is a very good motivator for somebody who is not quite motivated enough to do this all by him or herself in order to improve their skills. Uh, to me, that's the ideal. When somebody doesn't need this kind of prompting, they're just going to do it. But uh, if this has to be measured, engaged, I think that this is one very good way of doing that. Another way is in this sort of virtual environment that we're doing is if, depending on the circumstances where they are, you can have them actually do it in a virtual study hall. We do this sometimes here. I mean, right now I'm looking at my PowerPoint, so I only see a number few of you on the side of my screen, but if this weren't here, we could have everybody open and you can see people working at it, doing it, and you could ask them questions and you could listen in. Uh, so um, you can have it done in a virtual study hall. Uh, I think a better way, ideal way of doing this is since we're gonna be working with a text that they're listening to and that they are understanding and that they're reading along, uh, ideally, as I said, is this will be a, a work of literature, a work of fiction in a foreign language from another culture. Um, it's not something they're necessarily going to understand without discussing. So have them meet and sort of using a hybrid model um, for a reading and discussion circle. So after the, in a program, they can come to us for three weeks or a month, or they can be in a program intensively. But uh, after the program is over, then you can still say, well, let's meet once a week, an hour a week, a set time. 
and we've been reading this text, so we'll answer questions about it. We'll talk about it, okay? So um, this kind of discussion group in a small circle uh, is a very effective way of getting people to actually then speak the language and use the language and have a topic that they're discussing. So uh, these are the, this is the, the essence of these two techniques. This is the essence of ways that you can use them. Uh, as I said, a couple of people came in late, I saw here, uh, these are skills and techniques that I've given presentations uh, much longer than this one, just on specific things, demonstrated them. Um, it's hard to get an idea of what these are just from being told about them. So uh, one thing that we could possibly do uh, for, if this intrigues students, trainees, if this intrigues you as an idea for people to come and do them, um, it's possible we can offer some study skills training, just as you can come to us for learning a specific language. Uh, if you like, we could offer a customized study skills practicum, uh, specially designed for your students, your needs. Uh, I was told to, to focus on the sort of things that I thought, well, scriptorium and shadowing might be good for, uh, but there are dozens of different techniques, different uh, self-study skills that one can use, uh, dozens of different targets or goals that people have. Um, so uh, it's possible to teach study skills as such, either directly to trainees, if they are highly motivated and they really want to learn on their own, or to trainers, train the trainers, and then trainers can go and train the trainees. So um, this would be a way to get more knowledge about these and other techniques. So um, that's my presentation about these skills. And uh, I hope that was interesting and useful to you. And if you have any questions, comments, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you so much, um, Alexander. And I'd like to encourage people if you'd like, if you do have a question, but you um, don't want to um, unmute, you should please feel free to put um, your questions into the chat. I'll be monitoring that and asking uh, Alexander any questions that come up. Um, I do have a question, though, if you don't mind. I'm wondering if you could just demonstrate this shadowing technique, because it's very difficult for me to imagine. I'm thinking even in, in um, my first language, which is English, I don't know if I'd be able to talk along while I'm listening to something. Would you, um, would you indulge me and, and be willing to demonstrate what that looks like? <laughs> so that's some Arabic and let me see what else I have on here. So uh, were you, so were you listening and then pausing it or you were talking no. along with it? No, I was speaking along with it. Okay. Speaking along with it. Um, so let me see. Uh, Alexander, do you sometimes record that when you speak to it at the same time? Alexander, musafarat bidan, tu pezud ta mekodeshno baraye raftan, amade kardan, pedar gufte gud sa ate hash rah miuftid, ba yad hame hazer shode bashad, hame yek digaro kamat bi kardan, parvin di shab baraye tu yerah kazapukte gud, kazaro tu yebar richt ba bedaste akbar dad. Parvino simin, the Komake Hamdige, Chamidunaro Bastam, Simin, Le Basaye, Kashangesho Bartashto, Darsake Hodesh Kazosht. Did like, you want to ask your question, Martin? I wasn't sure if Alexander's on or not, but yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sometimes record yourself so you can listen to yourself and see how your recording, uh, your voice sounds compared to the native voice or to the recording. Yes, you can, you can certainly do that. And if you record yourself, 
not just listening uh, on your own. There are programs that you can do. Um, the most common, easiest program to use is a program called Audacity. Uh, and so when you put Audacity in there, you can actually see the readout of the voice. Um, so you'll see like, spikes and things like this. Uh, and so you can't just rely on your own ears. You can see a printout of your own voice and of the voice there. And so you can say, well, I've got my spikes over here on this way. So yes, yeah, so you can record yourself uh, and you know, just by listening, uh, ask somebody how you're doing or you know, do that, get that visual aid by, by seeing it on the readout there. Would you suggest for less proficient uh, speakers to slow down the recording uh, to begin with, or is that something you? Uh, yes, certainly. With? Yeah, you can do that. Yes, slowing the recording, and again, using a program like Audacity, you can take it and slow it down, slow down the speed, five percent, ten percent, get it slower, um, so that you can start doing that. Um, again, any speed, it still seems very, you know, you tripped your tongue over it, uh, and so you want to make sure. And also, when you slow something down, it gets muddy and unclear. Uh, and so that makes it actually harder to slow it down too much. But uh, that's certainly something that one could do. I guess I had a separate question from the technical piece of how to do it. But in terms of how does how do you then build your vocabulary from a scripted situation like this, where you're mimicking something else, either in scriptorium or in shadowing, so that you can build your vocabulary and use it in a in an unscripted kind of situation. But actually, because what you're doing is that technique of extensive reading by by saying these words, by hearing these words, by understanding them in the context, you're making them part of your vocabulary. So there's no need to, you know, take this word and, and sit down and, and learn it independently, study it and memorize it because you're hearing it repeatedly in the text. You're speaking it aloud. You become comfortable with it. So. Um, I'll, yeah, over time, by doing this, your vocabulary will definitely increase. Are you aware of a data bank that has uh, different languages, uh, some materials in different languages at different proficiency levels? I'm just trying to think of how do I, as a language learner, identify material that's appropriate for me to be in that range where 98% is something I know already, right? Yeah, um, there. That, that can be difficult. Um, that is, you know, there are some places, you know, uh, again, for uh, commonly studied languages, there are readers that are set with a certain vocabulary level, but uh, for less commonly lang studied languages, uh, which I think are most of, of yours, that's uh, a harder thing to do. Um, this is um, a research project that when I was at the um, Regional Language Center in Singapore, uh, I was working on this as a, as a research project, and Paul Nation was a guest um, professor there too. And so, you know, he was sort of helping me out with that. And we were looking at some way that you could run a text through uh, sort of a vocabulary recognition thing, see which words are in there, okay, um, and get an idea of the, you know, the number of, of known words uh, that are in a given thing. But this is really, um, he was only doing that with English, and it was a lot, you know, a lot harder to, you know, to start plugging this in with other languages. But there are people that are working at that. Um, you would just sort of have to um, start getting an idea of what kind of text, what authors are familiar to you, what kind of texts are to you. But yes, that that can definitely be a challenge. What you're describing, the process you're describing with shadowing um, reminds me a lot of at, at CLV, we teach a lot of songs. And so, um, you know, the kids really learn um, whole pieces of language, like you've mentioned in context. But this is, um, but here it seems like they also get, like you mentioned, the, the natural speaking rhythm and things like that, which can be very elusive to students. Yeah, I, I, I see the affinity towards, uh, you know, towards singing along with something towards, you know, and, and it's, I think it's a commonly noticed phenomenon that when people sing, uh, they don't have much of an accent. Somebody might, you know, somebody might sing a song and they sound like a native speaker. They don't have any particular regional accent. Uh, and then you hear them talking and they've either got a strong regional accent or a foreign accent. And somehow when you're singing it, it, uh, it doesn't uh, come across that way. And I think that, you know, it, <laughs> If you're going to learn a foreign language as an adult, the odds are that you are probably always going to have something of 
probably a rather strong accent uh, and intonation, but you can get the best that you possibly can. You can improve as much as you possibly can. And I think that this uh, sort of shadowing is kind of akin to that singing. I mean, if you don't want to go around singing all the time to people, you know, then you need to learn to speak to them. And I think that um, there is a musicality to every language. There is a, uh, a tonality specific, specific, um, yeah, rhythm specific beat that each language has. Uh, and that's something more than the individual pronunciation of words that I think can make comprehension of somebody really difficult. If they don't have that natural rhythm, they might pronounce every word correctly, but if they don't have that natural rhythm and flow, um, then it's very hard to follow them. And I think that shadowing can definitely help with that. Even if your pronunciation never gets perfect, uh, it should get better. And that sort of natural flow and rhythm will also be there. I'm wondering where the analytical work of, of reading and listening fits into this, because um, I think traditionally we focus more on, for comprehension, we focus more on analyzing, explaining, answering questions about text. Where does that fit into this process? Do you do it before or after? Or? Well, I still have up on the screen here. You could do that in a reading and discussion circle, coming together and you know analyzing it and saying this. But um, as you know, as as a, as a self study technique. Are you going to sit there and ask yourself these questions? You're going to analyze on your own. Um, that's uh, you can do that, but in order to do that, I think you need to have that sort of intensive experience of or extensive uh, experience of, of reading a lot and saying a lot. And so, uh, by virtue of of taking a longer text and trying to follow it and trying to understand it and trying to um, make sense of it from day to day and see how the story is developing, as it were, by by definition, you're going to be, you know, analyzing it, and making sure that you have the connections in your head. And uh, again, if that's difficult, then that's probably a sign that the text is too difficult. And I think Martin, in answer to your question, that's that's a way that you would notice by default. I mean, you you can look at a text, and when you first hear that number, you think, wow, you know, it's like if I just tell you, oh, I've got 90% comprehension, you think that's great, you know. But 90% comprehension means out of every 10 words, I don't know one. And so if you imagine a page of a hundred of, of 300 words, that's 30 words. I don't know. That's a lot of unknowns on there that come jumping out at you. And so if you just keep adding to that. Yeah, you do need to have about, I don't know if you necessarily have 90, 98% coverage, one out of 50, but certainly 97, one out of every 33 words, you know, you need to, to know that. And if you don't, um, you can, again, the, the test will be, well, I, I read this, I read a page and I think I understand everything. Then I read five pages and I'm not quite sure. I feel like I'm losing the thread. And I read the whole chapter and it's like, well, I know what it's about, but I didn't quite get everything. And, you know, and then you read a second chapter and you say, I don't really understand what's going on. That's how you would know that the, the text is kind of too hard for you. Uh, and so that's when, um, as a corrective, you could have these reading and discussion circles. That's when you could come and, and, and do the analysis. But it's um, sort of a self-prescribed analysis. Um, these are designed more to get the input, get you, you know, have comprehensible input coming in that's going to increase your comprehension. Uh, and then you can do that analysis. Another thought I've had just as I'm processing this in terms of, you know, if I were to approach doing this for French for myself, uh, because I'm too shy about going to a class and speak. Uh, so I want to prepare myself for that. Um, what about grammar? So how do you pick up grammar? Because that isn't always necessarily clear in the context of things, at least maybe uh, for more seasoned language students, it is. But for me, that, that that's a difficulty I have sometimes in French specifically, like the subjunctive or conditional and, and some of those. Well, again, that would come out more, I think, in the scriptorium because you would be making those mistakes and you'd look and you'd say, well, with French, you know, the problem with French is that, you know, you have a lot of verb endings in particular that have very different spellings, but the same pronunciation. So you might have learned how to say it from the uh, scriptorium, the, the, uh, the shadowing exercise. So you can say it, but then when you're sitting there to write it, you look at it and you say, oh, wait, wait a second. It's not spelled that. I just spelled it one way. And so you have, you would, you know, you have to do that correction and noticing uh, that you've spelled it incorrectly. And then you would um, need to 
notice that. And yeah, I mean, if it's something that you have no knowledge of, I'm, I've been presuming all of this is for a relatively advanced student, a mature student who would have recourse to some sort of grammar or a reference book or a teacher when they could ask questions and they're confused. But the first step is to notice that. So yeah, verb endings with French would be a classic example that you would have to self-correct for when you do this. And then as you notice them, you know, you would look at them. Oh, well, that with the subjunctive endings, well, when are you doing it? Okay, well, here, as you, as you say it and as you write it, you get used to it. Um, that's all, all, all grammar is, is getting used to the correct way of doing something and using something. Uh, and so by taking longer and longer phrases with French and writing them down, you would get used to something like the subjunctive. So what you're saying is these are really techniques for when you've covered the grammar, but you have like fossilized errors in your writing or your speaking. It's a way of sort of ironing, these, of ironing yeah, those out. These would be ways of, of getting them out. These are not techniques for, um, certainly scriptorium is not a technique for beginners. Okay, These are techniques that I would prescribe for um, the way that I'm describing them here. I mean, shadowing is something that you can use to start learning a language with uh, the correct kind of didactic text. Uh, uh, other things, these are techniques that can be used, but the way I've described here, uh, I'm imagining advanced students, people who have a high degree of proficiency uh, and who want to get better, who want to smooth out errors, who want to improve things. These are, these are techniques for high intermediate, low advanced students. And I should, I should mention, we have some students in the LTC programs who are actually first um, language speakers of the language that they're studying. For some reason, they get really stuck um, like at the two, two, two plus level and breaking through to the three level is sometimes more challenging for them because they've been speaking their whole life with certain kinds of um, um, errors. Of course, they're, they're just, um, it's more colloquial ways of speaking, especially in the um, Spanish programs. And it seems like this is a way, this would be a, uh, a technique that would really help them, um, you know, push up into that more academic or uh, sort of the, the kind of language that's expected at the superior level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something that would help somebody develop language at the superior. Uh, yeah, that would be a very good candidate. Somebody, as you said, sort of a, a heritage speaker of a language like Spanish that just picked it up in a very colloquial form. Uh, for most of their life can speak it with great fluidity, you know, and, and, you know, understand everything and use it. But when you look at it, it's like mm, the, the, the vocabulary level and usage is not that of an educated native. Uh, and how can they get there? Well, if they took a book that's written by an educated native and practice saying it the way that educated native would say it and also writing it and noticing what the grammatical errors are and noticing when they do it, then they would become habituated to that and be better able to do that. So, yeah, that would be a, those would be good candidates for this too. Don't mean to ask all the questions, but now I'm curious about uh, suggestions you may have for people who are more at the beginning or intermediate level. Just if of your favorite techniques that you could share or talk about a little bit in that regard. Put me on the spot here without a prepared slide, but. <laughs> well, these, again, you know, I'm recommending that you use these kind of techniques with um, a, a novel and an audio book that are intended for native speakers. So if you're, you know, if you're doing this for French, you're not going to want to use what I'm describing here. You're ideally, you're not going to go get something that's intended for an American learning French. You're going to get a book for a French person reading French. So you want to use native materials for this. So you would just back that up. Um, you could use this very well as a pure beginner um, with um, certain kinds of didactic material, certain kinds of, um, if you have in particular, if you have uh, the kind of textbook that I myself prefer for starting to learn a language, um, will basically will provide this. I mean, it'll be very simple, basic text, but you'll have the text in the target language and you'll have the recording in the target language. It can be very basic, we, you know, simple sentences, but you can start out with that. So um, if you have that kind of didactic material available to you, you can use the same mate material with very things like this. And then, um, yeah, for intermediate, you know, low intermediate people, you know, sort of uh, um, level two people, Level, you know, European B level people, you could use um, there in particular, a language like French, there are any number of books that have been adapted 
for learners. So something that's you know not not a beginning textbook, but also not a text for a native speaker. You could, in theory, you could use use these things. But at those levels too, I mean, you are also when you're very beginner. I mean, you need to do more conscious grammatical drilling, conscious grammatical learning. You need to do you know you need to make sure you have your base vocabulary covered. So there are other things that you would need to do. Um, whereas for the advanced stages, I'm presuming that those things have basically been covered. I mean, I just assume for all of this, you've had a complete overview of the grammar. Doesn't mean you've mastered it, doesn't mean you know everything, but you know, there are, shouldn't be something, oh, I never saw that before. When you get to this, you should have seen everything. If there are no other questions, if there are other questions, we'll leave it, we're happy to keep going. But at the same time, I also wanna thank Alexander for sharing the expertise with us and experience. Obviously, there's many years of, uh, applying these techniques and others. And uh, if you're really curious, there are hours and hours of uh, videos and conversations of Alex with Alexander on YouTube uh, under his name, uh, uh, including on shadowing. Uh, like you said earlier, he's done presentations on this uh, for um, uh, many larger presentations and longer workshops and those kind of things. So uh, really appreciate you doing this tonight, Alexander, and sharing your insights, experience, uh, uh, and thank everybody else for coming.